So welcome everybody to the EU side event, uh, Climate Change Mitigation Adaptation Through Coastal Ecosystems Conservation and Restoration. Coral reefs, mangrove forests and seagrass meadows are marine and coastal ecosystems that pro provide a multitude of benefits to society and ecology, including climate adaptation and mitigation. The session will present approaches to restore and conserve these ecosystems, uh, as well as showcase field practices, discuss adaptive capacity, uh, knowledge sharing, and the scaling up of restoration activities. I'm very happy to be your host this afternoon. My name is Michael Sweet. I'm a professor at the University of Derby in the UK, and also an uh, officer of the International Coral Reef Society. The session has been co-organized by Simon Harding, uh, the co-chair of the co-, co uh, of the Conservation Committee uh, from the International Coral Reef Society, uh, Stefan van Hoot, who is also one of our speakers from Friendship, uh, and Angela Stevenson from GEOMAR. We have s seven distinguished speakers, or six at the moment, uh, Peter Thompson, the UN Am uh, Oceans Ambassador, Martha Rogers Uriga, uh, Secretary General Ramsar Con Convention, who will be online. Um, David Abora, who's a Kenyan delegate, uh, Corrido East Africa and ICRS representative, Thorsten Roosh from GEOMAR, uh, Simon Cripps, uh, executive, ex executive director of marine conservation at Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, Mina Hips, uh, director of the Global Marine and Polar Program, IUCN, and Stefan, as previously mentioned. Uh, we are going to be welcoming uh, questions from the audience at the end. Uh, to ask a question, you must scan the QR code, uh, which will appear on the screen, um, and you can utilize that, and we will uh, provide that to the panelists at the end. So, without further ado, um, we'd like to, uh, we're going to miss uh, Peter, so we're going to uh, invite Martha, uh, who should be an online uh, presentation. Hopefully, Martha will come online soon. I am. Can you hear me? <laughs> Hello, Martha. Welcome. Hello. Over thank to you. you. Can you hear me well? Very well, thank you. So, thank you so much for, for this opportunity to, to be part of this event. Um, unfortunately, I, I could not be with you, um, given that uh, we are holding an extraordinary COP and it's taking more time than uh, we initially thought. Uh, but uh, I wanted to, to, to say that this is really a very time, timely event. Uh, and it's really important uh, to have this focus on coastal and marine ecosystems uh, while the COP26 uh, is meeting. Uh, because, uh, as you know, these ecosystems uh, are very, very important, not only in terms of the values for, for conservation uh, of biodiversity, but also for climate change. And they have uh, many benefits. And I would like just to very quickly highlight some of them, which I'm sure this is going to be further developed uh, uh, during the discussion. Uh, the first is that um, we know that these uh, coastal and marine ecosystems are very, very efficient in terms of carbon storage. Uh, just to give you an indication, blue carbon ecosystems capture and store carbon in their sediment up to 55 times faster than tropical rainforests. They're also critical for adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Uh, and we have evidence of that on how they protect coasts uh, from extreme events, and we have, for example, research, a very recent research from IISD uh, that showed that uh, restoring wetlands uh, such as swamps or mangroves uh, to buffer sea level rises and protect against extreme events could save $248 billion globally. And this is half as much uh, what it would cost if we were to build infrastructure to deliver the same protection. But as I mentioned, beyond climate, uh, these ecosystems are very important for biodiversity, for food, for livelihoods. And to give you also another example, uh, it's important to know that at least two thirds of all the fish consumed worldwide are dependent on coastal wetlands. So the evidence is there, the numbers are clear. Uh, however, despite this, uh, these are uh, among the more, more, uh, most uh, threatened ecosystems on Earth today. Uh, and we know, for example, that for coral reefs, 75% uh, of the world's reefs are at risk and 10% are already damaged beyond repair. And mangroves, 67% uh, were lost in the last century and 20% have been lost in the last 25 years, which is at a very, very rapid rate. So when we degrade these ecosystems, we are losing the services on biodiversity, on livelihoods, but also on the, the role in climate change, more for mitigation and adaptation. 
And if we don't protect and restore these ecosystems, we are going to be, we will not be able to meet our shared biodiversity, climate change and development goals. So how to do, what to do then? And I, and I know that in this uh, event, uh, there is going to be a discussion about commitments. And I wanted to just uh, highlight, uh, given that I'm speaking on behalf of the Convention on Wetlands, um, to give you some elements of what commitments exist uh, currently that are very and directly, directly relevant to these particular ecosystems. So the Convention on Wetlands is an international legally binding treaty for uh, wetland ecosystems, both inland waters and marine and coastal. So this represents a legal commitments of 172 countries. So what does this mean in practice? So these countries have designated over 2,400 wetlands of international importance worldwide, of which around 1,000 contain coastal and marine areas and this cover over 75 million hectares. So this is one, if not the world's largest network of marine protected areas. The parties also commit to use all the wetlands, including coastal and marine ecosystems wisely. That means sustainably. And further, the parties have uh, committed to linking wetlands and the contributions to climate change by adopting a resolution on blue carbon at our last COP. Um, our technical panel is developing also a guidance on how um, by blue carbon ecosystems contribute to climate mitigation. Our parties also have data, they do inventories and they're measuring the extent of these ecosystems to track their status. And the convention is cooperating with other international frameworks that are very relevant for the discussion today. Of course, with the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, which is going to set some clear targets and indicators that include coastal and marine ecosystems. And the convention also works very closely with other processes, including, um, I am honored to be the, the focal point of the mangroves community of ocean action. Uh, so working very closely uh, with Peter in terms of uh, getting action and engagement from all countries and all partners and all stakeholders uh, to address uh, the mangroves uh, conservation. So just to, to end, this convention does provide a key platform for international and national action that offers a huge potential for scaling ecosystem protection, wise use and restoration to achieve the level of climate mitigation that we need. So to conclude, I just wanted to, to focus on four points. Um, first of all, well, we, need, we have very little time to act and we need a lot of ambition. So which are some very specific things that I think we need to do. The first one is to scale knowledge and concrete practices. We know what works, we know how to do it. So, and in this event, we will be hearing some important contributions in this regard. Secondly, is to leverage and strengthen existing commitments, instruments and tools. So let's use what we have. And thirdly, we need to integrate these ecosystems in climate action, especially NDCs and in climate investments to achieve the ambition of the Paris Agreement. And finally, we need to redouble finance for conservation, wise use, restoration of coastal and marine ecosystems as nature-based solution for climate, but also for the multiple benefits that they provide for people and the planet. So I look forward to a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity to share these thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. That was fascinating. Um, uh, hopefully you can stay online for the discussions um, in the not too distant future. Um, so to, to move swiftly on, uh, I'd like to introduce you to David Abora, um, who's going to give a presentation about the International Coral Reef Society's uh, Science to Policy, I think. Thank you. Um, my, so, good afternoon. I'll present um, on a Science to Policy paper that we wrote in the International Coral Reef um, Society and released at the Quadrennial Symposium that we have held earlier this year. So it's an honor to be here to present it on behalf of the society and um, the, the co-authors. I can have the next slide, please. Uh, given the time that, that we have on the panel, I won't go into summarizing uh, all of the science behind this, but the paper, the objective was to really synthesize the science in order to support strong policy platforms, which I'll present on a bit more. If you can click again, please. There should be some animations coming up. 
as I think this is the old presentation, so click five times uh, if you can, and then we will get to the next slide as soon as it flicks. So uh, I don't need to summarize how much people are dependent on coral reefs around the world for this audience, I don't think. Uh, and then also the dire state of coral reefs at the moment, if you can click through twice more. So we estimate that 50% of reefs have been lost globally um, in the last 50 years, perhaps, or longer. And just in the last 10 years, 14% uh, of reefs have been lost, estimated through the, the new report by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. And this is as a, as a result of multiple threats, of which climate change, of course, is one of the dominant ones uh, and is only increasing in importance around the world. What we wanted to focus on in this, uh, in this uh, presentation is on the solutions, of which we think uh, there are several solutions. As um, Martha Roe has just uh, stated, there are things we do know already that we can act on. So, and we put these into three buckets. So on one was global actions uh, on to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The second one, if you can click twice, is local actions to improve local conditions, and that's addressing all the local threats that affect coral reefs. And then the third is thinking towards the future in terms of what we need uh, as, uh, as climate change progresses, knowing that even with the best climate future ahead of us, a one and a half degree future, we will still lose, we estimate 70 to 90% of reefs globally. We've already lost 50. So that means losing half of the reefs we have today, even if we do implement the Paris Agreement. I think it's very important the countries realize that because uh, we need to do everything that we can over the last 30 years, even against a declining trend, in order to have a positive trend in the future. So if you click again, um, this, we put these three as, up as three pillars uh, of a policy uh, platform uh, to push forward. So under pillar one, reducing global climate threats, of course, that's meeting the Paris Agreement. That's what this, uh, this COP is all about. Um, it's critical to minimize coral reef losses into the future. There are many um, actions that we know that we can do in terms of uh, energy uh, systems to make this happen, and then financial markets to, to um, incentivize that. The image here focuses on mangroves and blue carbon because there's many local solutions that need to be put in place to mitigate climate change as well. And we think these must be an essential part of that mix um, as well. Uh, the next slide. On pillar two, to improve uh, resilience at local scales, again, there has been an immense amount of science, which the scientific community, I think, has, has developed very well. Uh, we know that healthy fish communities and good water quality are essential uh, for reef health, and that these can be achieved through protection, through marine protected areas, or through locally managed marine areas. Uh, we can have further advances in the science and monitoring, uh, and in uh, how to integrate information to support building resilience. The, third the next slide, please, is on the third pillar, is really the, the future is looking towards how to improve techniques for active restoration. So as we move forward uh, and lose coral reefs, even with, um, with the best climate future we can have, that by the time we get to that stabilization point, we will have tools in place and we'll be able to really prioritize and promote the recovery of corals that are adapted to that future and that can perhaps repopulate the areas from which reefs have been lost and to, to regain a lot of ground. So the next slide, please. So um, we need to build on existing successes, um, invest in adaptive innovations, and action this decade is essential. Uh, we believe we have eight to 10 years, perhaps, to, to be able to meet the one and a half degree future, so there's no time to waste. So next slide, please. So the policies that we focused on for this paper really focused on the decadal scale because none of this happens quickly. Um, so both the CBD, uh, the biodiversity pr uh, COP and the processes and the climate processes require several years, of course, to, to meet the agreements that are made. Um, and these align very well for this decade with Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals and provide a very powerful platform to really move forward in an integrated and holistic way. Uh, there are two UN decades that are very important for work on coral reefs, the UN decade on ocean science for sustainability and on ecosystem restoration. So really leveraging the power of those decades is very much a part of this plan. The next slide, please. So to deliver on the three pillars, um, it's essential, and if you click three times, please, um, that we have a cross-cutting and integrative approach across these pillars, not to try and address any of them in isolation. 
So we identified three asks. So the first to establish commitment and ambition uh, to halt dangerous climate change and reverse biodiversity loss. The second ask is really to pr promote coherence so that actions under one pillar can also support actions under other pillars, such as improving local conditions with, with mangrove and seagrass restoration can have uh, an important contribution to reducing uh, greenhouse gas uh, in the atmosphere. And then the third ask is to drive innovation across these three. The next slide, please. So across this decade, uh, just summarizing a little bit, um, I've already mentioned the uh, policy processes that are critical for establishing the commitment uh, across this time period. To promote coherence across these three pillars, we need uh, coordination. So global coordination can happen through the International Coral Reef Initiative is very strong and the International Coral Reef Society. Um, but there are also very important regional mechanisms that can facilitate action in different coral reef regions. Um, and the local and national mechanisms are very important to s support, particularly with our understanding of the importance of local adaptation and local agency in communities and indigenous peoples and so on for really taking action uh, on coral reefs and other coastal ecosystems. And then, and the third ask to drive innovation across all of these, this really requires funding, much more than we have at present. The Global Fund for Coral Reefs is just starting now, as is the, the G20 uh, Research and Development uh, Accelerator, uh, initiated uh, through Saudi Arabia's uh, chair of the G20. And there will need to be a lot of support to improve innovations in building resilience and data transparency and sharing. A uh, circular economy to really address the economic threats that affect coral reefs uh, is critical. And then to mainstream biodiversity and policy processes. So I'll finish with the last slide really just summarizes these three uh, pillars uh, that we push forward on the policy perspective. So one and a half degree future to uh, support local actions to build resilience and then to uh, conduct research and really engage in active restoration uh, to improve coral reefs into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. If you would like access to the policy event, you've got it on your flyers. If you scan the little QR code, you'll get the full PDF. But we also have some hard copies if you'd like to take them away with you at the end as well. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce you uh, to Stefan from the NGO Friendship, who's going to give you a, a more specific example of how this can work. Yes, thank you. Uh, so. Um, Mangrove restoration or ecosystem restoration is always a, a, a big challenge uh, and especially in a country like Bangladesh uh, and I will explain you uh, why the program that has been uh, built by, by Friendship for uh, Mangrove Restoration Reforestation in Southeast Bangladesh, why it's uh, successful. Uh, and to cut short any suspense, uh, it's because we have been able to bring together all the stakeholders in a uh, strong relationship of trust. And I will <coughs> now uh, a little bit explain uh, uh, what we are doing in the field. So next slide, please. So uh, first of all, it's uh, good to present you very shortly uh, the context of Bangladesh. Uh, if you don't know, this country is a low-lying country. It's crossed by uh, uh, 300 uh, rivers, so uh, it's uh, a water country, and uh, <coughs> as such it's uh, uh, highly vulnerable to cyclones, storms, and, and the uh, uh, coastal belt. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there is a big problem, uh, so actually the, the, the water, when there are storms and, uh, and cyclones, the, the uh, water from the sea is literally pushing to uh, the land and, and, and causing uh, uh, big problems of uh, erosion and hence the uh, saline water is going into the land and causes uh, salinization of the, 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 uh, the cultivation soil which is a, a big problem. Uh, the other problem is that uh, the embankments are really uh, uh, fragile, uh, very, uh, I, I will show you on a picture later. Uh, there is, uh, Bangladesh is also subject to a uh, high level of poverty and uh, high population density, so it increases the vulnerability of the people and the ecosystem because there is, uh, due to poverty, there is a, a, a strong pressure on the environment. Uh, there are limited economic opportunities. And where we are working uh, in this area, southeast Bangladesh, it's close to the Sundarbans, which is the uh, it's a UNESCO World Heritage and one of the biggest mangrove forests in the world. So next slide, please. So mangrove, they have uh, a utility. It's uh, it's an ecosystem that is not there, uh, uh, you know, by by mistake. It's uh, uh, in this low-lying country. It's really acting as a barrier. Uh, because it breaks the strength of the waves against the embankments. It's a really uh, a shield 
uh, a protection uh, for all the population against uh, the storms, uh, the erosion, uh, and it protects the human lives, uh, the crops, uh, the, uh, the cattle and the houses. So it's really important to restore this ecosystem also for biodiversity. So uh, no, you came back to the first slide. So second, uh, yeah, next, yeah. Uh, and also, as already mentioned by uh, Marta, I think uh, uh, she said that mangroves is really uh, also a nursery for a lot of uh, uh, resources and for, for animal species like shrimp, crabs, fish. So uh, many resources also for the local communities. And mangroves are known to store a lot of uh, carbon and capture a lot of CO2. So next slide, please. Uh, Mangrove restoration is something that is not new in Bangladesh. Uh, there, are, have, there, there, have many, uh, there have been many attempts to do that, uh, but the problem is that usually uh, communities are not involved, and as you can see on the picture, if you don't involve the community, uh, the goats are going to the plantation and they eat the trees, so they cannot grow. Another problem uh, is that uh, usually it's a monoculture, so as you can see at the bottom uh, left, uh, trees are too, uh, uh, it's too wide and so it, it, it's not effective to uh, break the strength of the waves. And as you can see at the bottom uh, right, uh, cyclones remain a big, big problem and there it's uh, uh, after Cyclone Amphan, uh, uh, one embankment broke and so the water is going into the land. And just to let you know, the last, uh, the last three years there have been three, uh, there have been four cyclones uh, in Southeast Bangladesh. So next slide please. So the way friendship is working is really by involving the communities uh, very strongly. We train them to uh, raise uh, uh, saplings, uh, uh, small mangrove trees in nurseries, and then they uh, plant these trees in uh, mud flats along the rivers uh, in this in this region, and they do it together. We train them to do that, and so it really creates ownership because once you have planted a tree, you're not you'll less subject to, subject to cut it down later because you know you have planted it, it's like your child and you know why you have planted it. It's also important to put fences all around the, um, the plantation uh, to protect from the goats and as you can see on the picture at the bottom um, uh, left, you can see the, the embankment that I was uh, talking about later I, and you see it's like one, one meter and a half uh, tall. It's not concrete, it's no stone, just, just uh, uh, soil uh, and sand, so it's, uh, it's really uh, eroding very quickly. And, after, uh, and, and the nature is, 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 is really uh, growing fast, so after a few months uh, you see the, the nature is uh, uh, already uh, uh, quickly restored and we plant five different mangrove species, in a, uh, at least five uh, uh, species in each, e each area. So next slide. So we engage the communities by creating uh, groups of uh, at least uh, 30 uh, people and each group is responsible for managing uh, one to two hectares of uh, planted forest and we put a strong focus on women and most vulnerable uh, people. An important feature in the program is that we draw together with the communities, they draw, actually they draw uh, themselves the maps of the plantation, where to put the fences, uh, where to put the gates to access the river, because if you block the access to the river, they will damage the fence and they will not uh, take ownership of the plantation, they will not be happy, so uh, the point is to, to make them happy, so involve them and we draw the map for the plantation. We give them uh, training, actually it's uh, the training on uh, capacity building about the nurseries and the plantation is done by the uh, Bangladesh Forest uh, Department. Uh, they're strongly involved in the program and we also uh, uh, ra raise awareness about uh, the benefits of the mangrove but actually they still know the benefits of the mangrove. To them uh, Sundarban is their mother, their uh, protecting mother, so they still know that but it's good to remind them and it's good also to link them with other uh, services, a kind of integrated uh, adaptation uh, system, uh, link them with other uh, public services or, or, or uh, like healthcare for example, which is for example healthcare is their first demand they really need to access healthcare. It happens that Friendship has a hospital next to this plantation, so we're able to also uh, give them an answer to other needs uh, uh, besides the uh, mangrove restoration. So next slide, please. Another important uh, part is that we involve other stakeholders and government stakeholders. As I said, Bangladesh Forest Department is strongly involved. We have also uh, agriculture officer for training on alternative livelihoods. 
and we have meeting with uh, local authorities uh, uh, very often because local authorities provide the land where we do the plantation is public land uh, and they ensure that after five years of active management and protection they will take care of the forest on the long term for uh, ten, uh, hundreds of years let's say uh, so next slide please so our lessons is that really the engagement of the communities and the local authorities is really essential to create trust. It's important also to create uh, opportunities and links with other services. Uh, no, we have big nurseries, so we're, uh, we're ready to expand. Uh, even if cyclones remain a challenge, we see that uh, still there is a result. Uh, uh, there, is still, uh, there is already some protection. Uh, and. Um, uh, we have no. We are now exploring some ways to attract new funders because funding is always the limit to do such restoration. But since mangroves uh, are uh, capturing CO2 and storing carbon, it's a really effective way maybe to attract new funders in this uh, restoration program. So next slide. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, it's just a summary slide. As I said, friendship is really bringing all the uh, stakeholders together together around this common good which is a mangrove forest which is a common good for not only the local population but for the uh, the whole world uh, and it's uh, aligned with uh, the uh, national strategy of bangladesh which is really restoring uh, mangroves and protecting uh, the sundarbans next slide so thank you thank you for your attention Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, fantastic to see the, the facilitation going on there um, in, in helping communities um, work in that, in that regard. Um, and lovely to see diversity and equality being brought into this as well. Um, so uh, I thought maybe we could get the QR uh, code just up so because we, we do want you to ask those questions. Um, so do please put those questions online so that we can uh, keep uh, asking those at the end. Um, and then we're now introducing uh, Thorsten. Uh, from uh, Geomar. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, welcome. I hope you can hear me well. Thanks uh, for the organizers to give us, uh, so myself and Angela, the opportunity to talk about seagrass as uh, one possible solution to the climate conundrum as nature-based solution. And um, next slide, please. Um, so seagrasses since about 10 years have uh, become also one prime topic of research on the blue carbon potential as seen here in this classic publication that uh, has them on par with the carbon capture potential of mangroves and seagrasses. Next slide, please. Um, and there's a substantial range of uncertainty, which is one of the issues I'm going to touch today. Next slide, please. Uh, so how does it work, the seagrass blue carbon? So on the one hand, we have this root rhizome mat that can uh, attain heights of up to two meters. So the best terrestrial analog would be uh, huge layers of peatland. And then additionally, particles are trapped in the seagrass canopy that are sinking down and are adding to the blue carbon potential. And of course, this canopy also fulfills many other ecological functions, including wave dampening, uh, on which, for sake of time, <clears throat> I cannot talk in any more detail today, but there are many other ecological functions, as already has been mentioned initially. Next slide, please. And so one of the, the big research topics is actually the heterogeneity of those carbon pools. So the case study here is from the Baltic Sea, um, a neighboring uh, the German coastline. And we see here from a case study of Angela Stevenson, that you already see visually from those cores that the carbon potential is very different between sites. Next slide. And so one of the salient findings here is that the, um, that the additional carbon stored through the presence of vegetation can be two to 60 fold that of unvegetated sediment or in absolute numbers up to 20 kilograms pure carbon. So times 3.6 would be the CO2 potential per meter square. So that's an enormous potential. However, one of the large questions, uh, open questions is what are actually the rates? So how long does it take for such a carbon pool to build up? Next slide, please. Um, so the many factors that led to the decline of seagrasses is eutrophication. So inversely, if we look at the potential of seagrass beds, again, case study here, Baltic Sea to expand would mean curbing of eutrophication, the Baltic Sea Action Plan 
uh, nine nation agreed um, pathway to curb coast eutrophication does exactly that. And here we modeled how much seagrass beds could expand in that area. So they could expand by 20% if eutrophication is curbed. And this would actually add to an endpoint pool of pure carbon in the sediment of up to 0.4 megatons. So quite substantial. But again, we don't know the rates. But that tells us that, of course, first and foremost, before restoration comes improvement of water quality, not just for seagrasses, but evidently also for corals, what we've just heard. Um, so yeah, conservation always beats active restoration. Nevertheless, next slide, please. In some circumstances, active restoration can be a good option, in particular if seagrasses have been lost in closed embayments, as you see here from this drone figure. So that used to be a lush seagrass meadow 20 years ago. I actually worked uh, here as a postdoc. And now we are doing here a small scale restoration, so relatively small scale at a sub hectare scale um, with divers. That, that's, of course, nice to restore a habitat, but to make really an effect for the carbon balance of, say, to make Germany net zero in 2050, this is less than a drop on a hot stone. Next slide, please. And so the end result should really also serve the policy interface here. So we would like to come up with solutions, local solutions, how to best uh, restore seagrass beds. And here, coming from a local example, what we see over and over again is that the actual restoration in a region, be it temperate, subtropical or tropical, must be tailored towards those particular environmental conditions. Um, and one of the trendsetters here have been Swedish colleagues with videos even, so we are envisaging to do the same thing to really have uh, how to do handbook for environmental managers. Next slide, please. Um, there has actually been one really su successful seagrass restoration in the US, uh, led by the group of Bob Orff and colleagues. This is a long-term effort, as you see, but they have been able through seed-based restoration to restore about uh, 36 kilometers square of seagrass and previously vegetation devoid inlets that had lost the seagrass mainly due to coastal eutrophication. And we see here on the right hand uh, insert um, how the carbon pools have been built up. So the light color is in kilotons of pure carbon, the above ground plant biomass, and the dark color is what has accumulated thus far in the sediment. So Upscaling is possible to the kilometer square scale, but it takes uh, uh, considerable effort and it also needs much more um, applied research at the various locations to make that seed method work. Next slide, please. So what is what is could be one way also to, to both involve the local communities and to save costs? That could, of course, be to involve uh, citizen scientists and uh, the local stakeholders, as has just been so nicely shown by the mangrove project. In particular, if you want to go for seeds, so having snorkelers here, uh, harvesting the seeds and later processing them. Next slide, uh, advance, please. And this involvement of volunteers, please advance the slide. Ooh. Yeah, that's been very, very nicely shown by the Project Seagrass in the UK. They, they have really, they are running a fantastic media campaign and having hundreds of volunteers that are distributing their seed bags to restore multiple sites at the same time. Next slide, please. So it's blatantly, so all my case studies were from the Baltic Sea, uh, so from a developed uh, country in the temperate zone. So this slide here makes it blatantly obvious that there are uh, very large world regions like South um, America and Africa where there has where there's very little um, research going into active restoration of seagrass beds and also the Indo-Pacific uh, where most of the species diversity resides as relatively compared to that great potential and potentially also the large loss rates very few restoration projects. This, of course, has to change to make seagrass um, uh, to, to um, utilize the full potential of seagrass beds as nature-based solution. Last slide, please. Yeah, so this is, these are the take-home messages. So what we urgently need are also sequestration rates to develop, develop carbon credits to start maybe having a positive 
uh, win-win uh, uh, circle uh, that also uh, some investment may be possible in giving money for restoring seagrass beds. But at the moment, this um, is difficult because we don't know how much carbon is accruing per year per meter square. And um, we need to upscale. This, as I said, stakeholders need to be involved. And finally, like in the corals, we also need to be able to breed plants that are tolerant towards heat waves. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thorsten. Um, obviously, as our, all these talks are, are technically in silos associated with their ecosystems, hopefully many of you understand that often they're very interconnected. Um, so you, oft, you would get that sort of textbook uh, scope from rainforests down to the, the beaches. Um, then you usually get mangroves moving into seagrass beds and hitting the reefs. So the, the importance of all these uh, built together as well uh, really shows the strength of how ecosystems can be resilient and adaptive. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to, to Simon uh, from WCS. Hello. Uh, I'm very grateful to the EU, the organisers, and Bloomberg Philanthropies for the opportunity to speak to you today. Sorry I'm reading. I've been given six minutes, and if I have lib, it's going to be 30 minutes, so <laughs> it's better I read. Um, the four aims of this presentation are, firstly, to show that some coral reefs can survive in some form at least, in a 1.5% um, degree change in climate, albeit as ICRS indicates, perhaps in a different form. Secondly, um, coral reefs and other coastal ecosystems are linked and interdependent, and so should be managed as such. Thirdly, that management needs to incorporate community benefits. We've, we've heard that from David already, I think. And fourthly, 30 by 30, is valuable for climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, next slide. In a conference that is heavily focused on terrestrial and atmospheric systems, as you might expect, it's important to remember that the ocean is a major carbon sink that absorbs up to 30% of anthropogenic carbon emissions. Key marine ecosystems like intertidal mangroves, which we've just heard about, seagrass, which we've just heard about, and salt marsh, sequester and store carbon at similar or frankly much greater rates than intact forests and peatland ecosystems. Healthy coral reefs increase productivity and biomass of these ecosystems as they are functionally linked. Next. Climate adaptation. Um, coral reefs are the most biodiverse of ocean ecosystems. You all know that, sitting here. They are, though, fundamentally threatened by climate change, which jeopardises the well-being of 500 million people. Luckily, the same number that you said, David. Um, science has identified coral reefs that can be managed to survive climate change, such as the 50 reefs portfolio. So survival is dependent on a range of parameters, things like coral reef species present, ocean currents, bathymetry, depth, um, the presence of uh, other stresses such as pollution, extreme weather, unsustainable fishing practices. So recent publications you will all have seen in the media um, have focused a lot on those coral reefs at risk and declining. And Absolutely, there is an enormous risk and we have to do something, as exactly as David has said. However, coral reefs are not and cannot be allowed to be a lost cause. Through careful choice, adequate governance, community support and efficient, equitable management, they can be managed to survive 1.5 degrees, um, albeit perhaps, as I said, in a form that may differ somewhat from today. So coral reefs are worth fighting for. Next. Effective, ethical and enduring management requires a holistic approach that protects and restores coral reef biodiversity and the health and resilience of linked coastal ecosystems. I keep using that word linked here as it's important. Including the blue carbon habitats of mangroves and seagrass. We need to aim for 100% sustainability of our oceans with at least 30% protection. That should be realistic. That needs to be realistic. Next. The 30 by 30 initiative 
protecting at least, as you know, 30% of the oceans by 2030, has created a new political momentum for achieving global goals for biodiversity and for climate. This is a climate initiative as well. It has established the ambition and the political will for conservation on a scale not previously possible, well, not thought possible. Um, it offers the chance to achieve biodiversity and climate wins, um, as the two priorities are intrinsically linked by offering an opportunity to address the major threats to, coral, uh, to coastal ecosystems, thus reducing the stresses to ensure coral reefs have a chance to adapt and survive climate change. But the reverse, I thought I'd run out of time, the, but the reverse is also the case, as by protecting coral reefs, you protect the health and the functioning of the oceans that are vital for climate mitigation. So adaptation is really important. Next, this holistic approach, both driven by and delivering on the 30 by 30 initiative, includes ensuring the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities to food, health, poverty alleviation, sustainable harvesting and livelihoods provision. Absolutely critical. This delivers direct benefits for both, but also results in a virtuous circle um, for those communities are then motivated and engaged to support conservation efforts. Um, this is, for example, central to our work in four regions. We've got with um, work we're doing with Blue Action Fund, who are so instrumental in, in promoting this, this approach. Next. Efforts to mitigate climate change through protecting blue carbon must go hand in hand with efforts to curb biodiversity loss in the most biodiverse of ecosystems, coral reefs. Um, also supporting policy, governance and sustainable economic frameworks integrated across tropical coastal ecosystems is required if coral reefs are to survive in a cl changing climate. Next. The UNFCCC ambition cycle um, and national planning and commitment processes offer us an opportunity to update and streamline approaches to address the climate and biodiversity cl uh, crises together, focusing on a dual mitigation and up to adaptation outcomes. However, there are key gaps in terms of comprehensiveness. So finally, in the last slide, um, our calls to action, action are, is that the next slide, climate policy, next one, thank you. Um, parties should maintain momentum by explicitly mentioning the ocean climate biodiversity nexus in the official decision at the COP26. Secondly, they should unilaterally improve their coastal commitments and plans. It will be very worthwhile to them if they do. Thirdly, they should support marine 30 by 30 commitments through NDCs because they contribute to climate adaptation and to mitigation. And fourthly, an holistic approach to managing intact, resilient coral reefs and coastal ecosystems is needed to protect blue carbon, coral reefs, ocean health, productivity, as well uh, as the communities that rely on them. And remember, and I want you all to repeat after me, and frequently, please, is there's no mitigation without adaptation. There's no mitigation without adaptation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some excellent, excellent action points uh, for hopefully some of their delegates to pass on to their party members. Um, so without further ado, uh, last but not least, uh, by any means, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Mina, the director of the Global Marine and Polar Program from IUCM. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. And I think I have a little bit of sense of what it feels like to be a fish in a tank, looking at all the people <laughs> passing by and peeping in here. Um, so very grateful for this opportunity. And I think uh, it's been an excellent presentations in terms of going from kind of the science to policy, what is it that we actually need to get there. Uh, we are here today because we're here for this, the COP. So of course, we are trying to link it. We're talking about climate change mitigation and um, biodiversity. So um, I work for IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, we're a membership 
organization with like 200 states agent uh, government agencies um, as well as NGO community and indigenous people's organizations um, so we go from kind of the highest level of governance working kind of the influence policy but also to work with our members and or the, on, on the ground and I see it's really important to have that, that link. So I think we need to start to think, what is it that we want to um, a achieve and get out of this? And I think um, we've all talked to, there is a terrible decline, et cetera. We need to reverse uh, the red, et cetera. But I think it's very clear. So we need to obviously re reduce or eliminate the threats. Uh, we need to kind of build resilience uh, and then, you know, enhance recovery. So the whole thing is like, well, we know what you want to do. We've setting ambitious targets and goals, uh, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the national level in terms of implementation, what you have to do. So there you also need to have, you know, capacity development. And we come up, I've listened to your wish list, and it's, it's great, um, because at the same time, we want to, uh, you know, have climate change mitigation, and uh, we want to conserve biodiversity. Um, and sometimes there's a bit of priority in what you want to achieve. Um, it's just as a little bit of reflection because I'm really pleased to see that nature-based solutions is really kind of, uh, it's much more prominent in the text um, here at this uh, UK COP and they really emphasized the importance of it and it's, it's critical in terms of mitigation and adaptation um, to have it and they say the estimate can up be up to 30 or some even estimate 40% of mitigation targets but you also have to work in adaptation. If you look at the national um, determined contribution, the, the last one that were round that was submitted, um, less than 20%, about 19% of all coastal states actually included uh, coastal ecosystem as part of uh, being a, a carbon sink. But, you know, we're also seeing a change there. So I think it's also important to kind of take stock and look at, you know, where are we going? Where are the positive? And, you know, big shout out to some countries that really you know, are, are championing this. Um, it's Kenya. We have Seychelles in terms of their new commitment of seagrasses. Uh, Belize, Chile, so the former COP, uh, which had the first blue COP. So I think there's, there's a, a lot of hope and a lot of things to celebrate as well. And I think it's also been echoed before. So what do we need to implement? Uh, not only do we need a technical assistance on the ground, uh, but we need a bit of that, what the, the boss word. I mean, every, you know, everybody's talking about blue carbon. Yes, it's a very sexy topic and blended finance. But how do you actually do that? Well, we know that there is the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, which is the first blended finance uh, fund um, that actually is dedicated to SDG 14 that solely focus on, on coral reef restorations. Uh, and there are other means, uh, you mentioned the Blue Action Fund. And again, it's mainly been uh, government or statutory funding for this. And now we want to mix it up. Up. So IUCN, what we also do, we try to, um, also as accredited entity for GCF and GEF, is basically to attract multilateral or bilateral funding sources and then mix it up with private capital. And I think particularly in nature restoration, it, it's very linked um, to the private sector and what we can do there to scale it up. Um, and um, so we provide, for example, um, a grant facility for somebody who wants to have, and is really, it's focusing on it's innate, maybe nature-based solutions, but part of that is really, um, um, it, it's, 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 um, it's not only looking at, you know, the, the, the benefit for kind of, it's all environmental and societal challenges as well as being economically viable. So I think the business model as well, whether what you're going into is, is really key, and I'm happy to uh, elaborate a bit more on that, but I know you have uh, some questions lined up, so maybe I'll stop there, and if there's more time later, I'm happy to elaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of named uh, projects and funds there, and I'm sure many people will be uh, taking notes there and maybe ask you some specific questions on that front. Um, so to start off with a, a largely uh, broad question, um, m many critiques uh, of uh, conservation programs are, are around scaling up. Uh, so uh, this, this is an open question to anybody. What, what is needed to really scale up uh, the restoration operations which have been discussed uh, here today and, and others as well? Would anybody like to uh, take the first stab at that one? David? Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mike. So I, I think from a coral reef perspective, um, for scaling up um, restoration actions, one more research is needed. We need more answers on what works and in what context, and it is very uh, scale dependent. So supporting the research and supporting the trials is critical. Uh, because it's very locally dependent, a lot of this research actually does need to be done in situ and with communities and with stakeholders present and with the actors who would be the ones responsible for, you know, actually upscaling in the future, as was demonstrated, I think, in, in the Bangladesh and the mangrove case. 
So I think a, a lot more support uh, to, to really work out what, what can work and how to do that. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, so regarding uh, mangrove restoration, this one a bit more specific. Um, so uh, is this tied into local area disaster plans? And if not, how is the long-term interest maintained? That'll be Stefan, I imagine. Uh, yes, so actually, uh, yes, because friendship, I, I'll take the example of friendship, which uh, it's uh, what I know uh, best. Uh, friendship is, is uh, first of all, and, and before doing mangrove restoration, active in disaster risk reduction, uh, we have uh, many solutions for uh, 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 risk uh, uh, management. Uh, we have, for example, a cyclone shelter uh, in the coastal belt, and we do a lot of preparedness also with the communities. Uh, it's, uh, we have a program called Community Initiated Disaster, Disaster Risk Reduction, and the uh, community themselves uh, um, build their plan to uh, to uh, adapt to in case of disaster. So uh, mangroves are, are, are very much linked with that because first of all you have to protect their belongings, their houses. Uh, we have also a, a program uh, of resilience to increase their economic resilience so that they can much more uh, adapt in or, or uh, uh, cope with the, the disasters when, when it strikes. So if they have savings, they're able to, uh, to start a new lab and not start from scratch because uh, uh, many studies have, have shown that the, uh, the poorest uh, people and the poorest uh, 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 communities pay a lot, a lot. Uh, millions and billions uh, already in Bangladesh for, from their own pocket to just rebuild their houses. So we need to protect that and we'll link that with all preparedness program, uh, rescue pro program and help. Uh, so uh, that's what Friendship is doing. So yes, the answer is yes, it's linked with disaster uh, risk reduction. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so another broad question uh, open to the, the panelists. Um, what, what toolbox uh, or, or examples of, of various uh, items to put inside the toolbox uh, would resource managers need to, to implement uh, some of the actions we've been talking about themselves? Peter? I'll have a go at that. Um, so <laughs> I think you have to make a state of the obvious. I think you have to make it valuable to local communities. They have to sit, there are various ways that it can be valuable. Uh, we've gone through, ecotourism is, is a common one, but you've seen what happens to that when you get a pandemic. So that's not a very stable um, opportunity. Um, but making, um, uh, it building into any management regimes right from the start, as much co-management as you get, as much support from local communities because as I say you get that virtuous circle once they once they support it um, then you have people then you want more of it and it then and that answers your other the other point about scaling because then you also scale it once you bring people on board with these so sort of circular economy uh, to, exactly to some that. degree yeah yep. uh, Mina did you no just to add to a question because you asked about uh, also on, on the toolbox and I think that you know, really, as you said, it's a very broad question, so it really depends on uh, what you're trying to fix. But I think in general terms, you would have to make sure you have the right enabling conditions. So you have set your policies, you have financial mechanism or, or funding available um, to kind of back up that kind of commitment. But then the toolbox that you need to go with, it depends what you want to do. But for example, if you want to go in a holistic approach and really have a sustainable long term, um, IUCN, for example, we launched an internationally global standard for nature based solutions. Uh, that's very, uh, uh, very much a facilitative tool. That uh, so you can help at different levels. The so government, you can set kind of policy and targets, um, and then if you want to implement it on the ground, you use that as a as a kind of a self-assessment tool to to move forward on this. Then there's also um, you know scientific guidance to do that. That's one. Uh, it's been a lot of mentioning on of. Um, effective management. Uh, there's also the green list, uh, which is also kind of looking at rewarding and incentivizing uh, and really takes, again, a very holistic approach when it comes to kind of inclusive governance, etc. I think all these elements are really uh, important. So, you know, just getting kind of the objectives uh, straight from the beginning uh, and manage, you know, expectation and involving all relevant stakeholders. 
Um, so, Mina, back at you. This is a sort of semi-related questions, but but flipped around. Um, so, you you were talking about the various resources which IUCN utilise um, to to allow uh, the adaptation uh, for people on the ground to do this. Um, but I guess some of that will work uh, in the other way to uh, for resources for policymakers uh, to make informed decisions. Have you got examples uh, of how these can be used uh, to be built into the the roadmaps to to help us reach net zero? Um, in, in various instances. You mean from a, from a global policy perspective? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, well, for example, on, on mangroves, we have developed uh, indicators, uh, global indicators, national, um, for, to go forward for the CBD post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, and we're, we're trying to do that uh, across the board uh, for different. We have um, newly adopted resolutions, which is really focusing, one is on particularly on coral reefs, to really kind of focus on uh, and recognizing the importance and you know getting that included in, in the text at the very um, top level and then all the way down to working with kind of toolkits and in terms of applying it and, and capacity building but I would say that's one example of um, pushing for specific indicators and targets. Fantastic I, I think we'll uh, wrap up with one last question can you just pull up the um, question and answer uh, document again because uh, my tablet's not working I saw another question up there Oh, there's a few more now. Um, so we've heard, uh, building on the comment of blended finance, can, can Friendship explain how they intend to attract investors for their projects? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> in, in two minutes. I know, <laughs> I know, I know who asked the question. <laughs> uh, so we're, uh, mm -hmm. we're actually trying to um, build a, a what we call the Blue Mangrove Fund to uh, attract uh, uh, mostly families or uh, SMEs who want to voluntarily uh, offset their uh, carbon uh, uh, footprint. Uh, and, and we invite them to invest in our mangrove restoration program. Uh, we have calculated uh, uh, the amount of, of, car of CO2 that, that one hectare of mangrove ca can capture. And we can say, OK, if you invest uh, X amount uh, of euro, we can restore X amount of, uh, uh, of mangrove or plant uh, X hectares of mangroves. And, uh, we, uh, and, and we hope that, that, that really, uh, again, uh, I come with uh, it's it's built on a trust. So we would like to create a relationship of of, of trust with uh, these people who really are conscious that they have an impact. Uh, their life has an impact in the in the environment. And it's not limited to where they live, but it's an, a global impact with uh, on the, on the world. And and also uh, they can compensate that somehow in restoring the capacity of the earth to absorb uh, CO2 CO2 with uh, the mangroves. Uh, and also uh, the program that we have is not only compensation but uh, first of all, adaptation for the local communities because we bring them new livelihoods. So uh, that's uh, that's something that we officially will launch uh, this <laughs> Blue Mangrove Fund uh, at the COP uh, on this Friday in the Benelux Pavilion at 9.30 uh, this Friday. Fantastic. You're welcome. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, obviously, I couldn't see uh, if, if Martha or... Um Thorsten was uh, putting their hand up for uh, any of those specific questions, um, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to catch up with uh, any of the delegates. Uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to hang around uh, for a small period of time and you can ask some more uh, specific questions to them. Um, and then if you've got anything else uh, associated with the um, ICRS, uh, we'll be hanging around for the next uh, week and a half. Um, and there's various people who have these pins, uh, so do feel free to come and talk to us. Um, and we welcome you into the society as well. Um, and you can really uh, act um, uh, and um, work up different things with, with uh, a, a certain amount of funding associated with that as well. Um, so hopefully we'll see some of you guys uh, join us as members as well. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much to the speakers. Uh, and thank you very much for you guys uh, for attending as well, without uh, which it wouldn't really work out very well. So thanks. Thank you.